Good evening. Welcome to worship tonight at Westminster OPC. Welcome all who are here and all who may be tuning in online. Trust God's blessings upon you as we gather together in the Lord's name. Just a few announcements. Let me draw your attention before coming to our service tonight. Um, items coming up this, uh, this week. Uh, we look forward to women's Bible study and midweek Bible study at their usual times. Uh, we're looking at uh, chapters 3 and 4 of, um, of the life of I, uh, R.C. Sproul uh, by Stephen Nichols. Looking at his becoming a, a student, teacher, pastor, and something else. And then uh, the beginnings of Ligonier in uh, western Pennsylvania. So that's for us on Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock. Join us for that. Uh, that will also be online if you want to tune in there. Um, I remember the, uh, uh, Don and Ann this week. They are uh, traveling tomorrow and will be gone for about a week. So remember them before the Lord. Uh, no men's fellowship this coming uh, Friday, but hopefully we'll get questions out this coming week. And uh, that's about it. Uh, installation of our RHM Chris Hartshorn is uh, on Thursday, October the 21st. That's around the corner. And I'll get uh, information out about the fellowship and the RSVP that's necessary for uh, joining in that. So that's all the time we'll take for our announcements. Let's turn our attention to our worship this evening. Our opening uh, hymn tonight is Hail to the Lord's Anointed, hymn 311 in the uh, Trinity Hymnal. Let's stand for the call to worship in uh, Psalm 93, a psalm that reminds us of the power and uh, stability of the world under God's rule before his throne because of his might. It is a psalm of strength, and uh, the title of this in my particular version is The Majesty of the Lord. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established of old. You are from everlasting. We worship an everlasting God who rules all the affairs of his creation and especially mankind. He loves his church. Let us come as his people now to worship the Lord together. Hymn 311, let us give praise to our Savior, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. 311.
Our Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to come before you, our eternal Father, our Holy Father, the one who has given us all things in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you, Father, as we come into your presence for your great goodness and love to us, for the salvation, the rich salvation that you've provided for all of your children. What a blessed people we are, Lord that you have adopted us and given us um, such a high and wonderful name when we were deserving of being cast out of your presence forever to continue to follow in the works of the flesh, the works of the devil himself as part of his family, as sons and daughters of disobedience. But Lord, you showed mercy and pity upon us from before the foundation of the world, you pitched your love upon a people to honor and glorify your name, to exalt your grace, and that your love would be magnified. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for our Savior. Thank you for having all things in him, that he is the one who comes down upon his church and waters us, uh, brings to us the refreshment that each of us need. We thank you, Lord, for your meeting with us tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your uh, glorious presence Thank you, Lord, that you shepherd your flock, that you call us each by name. You know, Lord, how to feed us, protect us, guide us. You carry the weak in your arms. You strengthen, Lord, your flock. You do all things well. And Lord, we are humbled before you tonight. Lord, we confess to you how far short we fall of our high calling, how far short we fall of the great love shown to us, and certainly how, how uh, how far short we fall from your holy law. Lord, increase our faith and bless our lives with greater obedience, we pray. Help us, Lord, to know um, with assurance the forgiveness of our sins tonight. Help us to worship you this evening as fit vessels, uh, vessels that have been washed and prepared to serve our master. Lord, fill us with your presence. Grant to us, Lord, the, uh, your hope through the power of the Holy Spirit as we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I'll take up our offering this evening as our ushers come. Let us uh, look to the Lord for his blessing on this part of his service tonight. Please join me as we give thanks. Our Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you in gratitude, thankful, Lord, for your provisions for us tonight. Lord, you are the one who provides our daily bread. You are the one who gives us rest. You are the one who provides us our, our daily labors. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you tonight with these gifts. We pray, Lord, that you'll supply the needs of your church. We look to you uh, for blessings. You who are the Father of light, with whom there is no variableness, no shadow of turning, your great commitment towards us, from whom every good and perfect gift comes. Lord, make us a thankful people as we give unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. in our time of prayer tonight led by our ruling elder Kurt Oliver. As Kurt comes up, welcome to uh, Seth Kennard and to Eli Herzl. Welcome, brothers. Glad to have you with us tonight. Been praying for your mom, Eli. Thank you. Any uh, updates on her? Uh, we had a hard week this week, particularly because my youngest sister, May, broke her femur. Oh. So now it's one less person to help take care of my mom person to take care of. Oh. Um, and then also just particularly difficult for my mom because she really wants to give her all to Meg and her all has been significantly reduced. I see. Um, so um, hard week and hard weeks to come, but we trust in the Lord and pray that we're blessed. Okay. 
well, communicate to her our love. We have her on our heart. We're praying for her all the time. So thanks for the update. Saints, we um, have one point of ref refuge from all our trials, and that's at the throne of our God. So let's go together to him this evening and bring our hearts before him. Our Father in heaven, our only refuge, the one who has created us and sustains us and who has redeemed us with the very, very high cost of his own son. Oh, Father, to you we come this evening to give you praise and thanksgiving and to bring our needs before you, for there is no other hope. Father, you have heard us as our pastor has, even this evening, confessed to you the sins of your people. And we rejoice that we can freely acknowledge our sins before you because in Christ we have abundant mercy poured out that we would be forgiven. And through him alone we come to you, thanking you that you hear our prayers. Father, we think of your providence in the history of man. And you have said that judgment begins with the, house of, uh, the household of faith. And there are times where There is upheaval and tumult and great sin among the nations and in particular communities. And we cannot but think, are you chastening our era, our civilization? because your people have been unfaithful. Oh, Father, we ask that you would be merciful and pour out upon us in our homes and in our churches throughout the Reformed Fellowship and beyond, Lord, throughout all the places that would call on the name of the Lord Jesus or would take on that name, sometimes running it in the, in the mud and pour out a spirit of repentance and revival and teach us, Lord, how to be faithful. Teach us how to be obedient. Work in us mightily by your spirit that we would be a people who reflect our Savior in all that we say and all that we do. In our very hearts, Lord, we ask that you would make us to desire what he desires, to hate what he hates, to praise you to the extent that he would praise you. For Lord, we are at a point where it seems there is great tumult here in our land. And Father, if it's 
the result of unfaithfulness, we would ask that you would reverse that and cause your people to be a lighthouse as they should be. O oh, Father, that your saints, the elect of God, who often are, are, are suffering, who hurt, who are weary, that we would be a people who care for one another deeply, that we would be congregations where the gospel is preached to such a degree that people cannot, cannot but be refreshed because Jesus is the Savior. Father, we think of the many needs listed in our prayer requests sheet. We have many who have struggled with various illnesses. We have those who wait upon you for long unanswered prayer, and yet now we see great hope that you are answering that prayer. Father, we think of those who um, have had surgery or are about to have surgery, those who have wrestled with just such serious diseases like cancer. And in each case, Father, we bring them before you and ask that you would have mercy on them and give them songs of praise in the night. In the darkest times, we pray that they would see the light of their salvation shining brightly in their hearts. O oh, Father, make us a people who in our suffering show the, the mercy of God and the hope of the gospel. And Lord, we pray that you would bring healing and, and, and cure and relief to those in their, in their pains. Lord, we do pray that you would bear up those who um, look to you for very deep um, deep emotional struggles as they have wrestled with um, loved ones who have gone astray loved ones who have um, betrayed the, the, the very Savior who bought them. We pray that you would comfort those families and bring back those who have strayed. Father, we thank you that we can ra raise up alongside uh, James and Rosemary tonight and rejoice with them that you have blessed them and you have strengthened them. And we ask that you would continue to do that, that they would know that as you have brought them together, you are guiding them every day. Father, we pray that you would fill their hearts with joy as they serve you. Bear much fruit through them, we ask. Lord, we ask that you would have mercy on our ministries, that the services we bring to one another through our congregation would be such that even generations to come would give thanks to you for how you have used this place and these people who have sought to, to love you here together. Oh, Father, we think of, of CCA. We thank you for that school. We pray you would bless it, continue to prosper it. We pray for the students who are learning so much. We ask for those who have even graduated from it and gone on 
through high school and college, Lord, we ask that their testimony would ring clear, that here is a place where Jesus is honored and where God is loved with all the mind. Lord, we think of the ministries we have to our young boys and our young girls. O oh, Father, raise up mighty men and women through these works, that they would be faithful all their days, that they would know how to love one another, that they would know how to serve sacrificially as Jesus did. We pray that they would see that there is nothing more fulfilling than living for you. Lord, we think of the ministry at Brookdale and we pray that you would expand that. We pray that those who have been lonely would be no, no longer lonely and that you would open our, our opportunities to care for them there. We thank you for the faithfulness of those who have brought services and studies every week. Father, we pray that you would bear much fruit. We thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters in resurrection. We ask that you would bring to them a Vietnamese-speaking pastor. We ask that you would prosper that work. We thank you for the citizenship class that they are offering, and we ask that that would be a, a testimony in this community so that many could hear the gospel, which is far more important than national citizenship. Lord, we ask for those who work in the various mission works in our presbytery and ask that you would prosper those works. Give energy and strength, give joy and bear much fruit there, Lord, that churches would be established that would be proclaiming the gospel for many, many years to come. Lord, we think of those who will be traveling, particularly Susan Winslow as she drives back from Kansas. We think of Don and Ann as they go. Lord, we pray that you would be with both of those travelers. Give them peace, give them great joy, give them safety. Bring them back to us, Lord, we ask in, in great, great rejoicing. Um, Father, we, we pray for Scott's mom and ask that you would give her a quick recovery from her surgery. Lord, we pray that she would be able to come home soon. All these things, Father, so varied, yet each one has only one hope. And together we would rejoice to bring each one of these needs before you tonight. Lord, we pray that as we hear your word tonight, you would speak to each of us, that we would hear with humility, that we would hear and be blessed with much grace from our God. Strengthen our pastor, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 620 in the Trinity hymnal. O oh Lord, I love you, my shield, my tower. It's an OPC hymn from Dr. Clowney. Let's stand as we sing together. Beautiful hymn. 620.
please be seated. Our Old Testament scripture lesson tonight is from Psalm 110. You have that in your bulletin or you can follow along in your Bibles. Uh, perhaps the, the uh, Sundays of having the scripture in the bulletin may be numbered. Time to shore back a little bit. We need to bring our Bibles and use our own scripture. Let every man bring their sword. Psalm 110, it's a messianic psalm, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. And therefore, he will lift up his head. And thus far, Psalm 110. And then that psalm is quoted in our scripture passage tonight in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 41 through 47. Let us give heed now to God's word. And he said to them, how is it that they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, David calls him Lord. And how is he his son? While the people were listening, he said to the disciples, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, and chief seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses, and for appearance's sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. And thus far the reading of God's word here at the end of Luke chapter 20. Our Father, thank you for your word that brings light to us about our way, who we are, but most importantly, teaches us about you. Help us, Lord, to rightly um, know the living God, and especially you, Lord Jesus, the incarnate one, the Son of God, the one who has come into this world, humbled himself, even to the point of death, and that death on a cruel cross. And Therefore, the Father has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, and seated him at his right hand, who is Lord of all, the only Savior of sinners. Lord, we bow before your word tonight. Oh, Lord, we are hungry and, and thirsty for your truth. And so fill us, we pray, that we would be better servants of you, knowing you, and making you known wherever we may go. So bless our time in your word tonight, we ask. For Christ's sake, amen. <clears throat> this passage here in Luke um, finishes up the round of questions during the last week, the week of the passion, as it's called, of our Savior. And in all of the synoptic accounts, Matthew chapter uh, 22 and in uh, Mark chapter 12, continues from there and speaks about um, uh, the scribes and as well the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew chapter 23 uh, carries into the woes against them. And in Mark chapter 12, it also deals with, uh, with these folk. It's interesting that in Luke's account, as we'll see next time, he deals with the scribes in order then to talk about the widow's might at the beginning of chapter 21. So we're really gonna be just looking at verses 41 through 44 here this evening. How is David's son, David's Lord? What is before us in this passage as Jesus responds to his questioners now with his own question is the topic of the incarnation. It is the reality that God has come in the flesh. He dwelt in this world in which you and I live. And that truth is at the very heart of biblical Christianity. Take away Christ, you have no true Christianity. 
As the ancient church father wrote, he through whom time was made was made in time. And he older by eternity than the world itself was younger in age than many of his servants in the world. He who made man was made man. He was given existence by a mother whom he brought into existence. He was carried in hands which he formed, nursed at breasts which he filled, cried like a baby in the manger in speechless infancy, this word without which human eloquence is speechless. Nobody writes like Augustine. Um, the incarnation is before us here in this passage tonight. Our, sub, our Savior's public interrogation has come to a close before these hostile inquisitors, uh, the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians have all had their time at the plate. They've swung their bats and they have whiffed. And now it's his time to turn the tables and to ask his question. And he chooses this passage in Psalm 110 that takes all who hear uh, to the very heart of biblical religion. Why did God become man? He actually asked two questions here. The first is, how is it they say that Christ is David's son? Notice that first of two questions in verse 41. How is it that they say Christ is David's son? This was no point of debate among the Jews. Both leaders and led agreed that the Messiah is the, um, uh, the son of David. Every Jewish family had on their living room mantle the words of 2 Samuel 7. The Lord declares to you, the Lord will make a house for you, David. When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I'll raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'll be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And on it goes, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So top to bottom, people of that day believed that Christ to be the son of David. Remember how this whole week began with blind Bartimaeus crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. The Jews accepted this and they longed for its fulfillment. But we also know that they greatly swerved in believing this coming king, this uh, uh, son of Jesse's youngest, would be instead some kind of a earthly conqueror, one who would uh, rise up against their Philistines of their day, namely Caesar and the Romans. And you can understand a little bit as you're reading through Psalm 110, there's some pretty graphic, powerful language there. But of course, that's not speaking about Christ's first coming, is it? It speaks about his second coming, when he comes with wrath, when he comes to judge all those who do not obey his gospel. So these Jews in, in, in Christ's day, they looked at their history kind of like a, a person who longs for better days in the past, golden days. They call them halcyon days, the days of David and Solomon. Oh, we hope they will return. Another temporal triumph. But David's messianic son is greater than David. So just going back to what had been before, is not what is in mind. And that's where the religious leaders all are stumped at the second question. Therefore, David calls him Lord. And how is he his son? Israel loved to esteem their patriarchs, loved to esteem their Old Testament heroes. These were great ones to be sure, but they were stuck in that past. Edward Reynolds comments on this whole dilemma here in this question. It does not fit that one sovereign is one son. No son is Lord to his father. Dominion does not ascend, but descends. There must be something above nature in him to make him his father's sovereign. And that's what they should have arrived at, but they didn't. Instead of following scripture, they looked to a new, um, which looks to a new and better covenant, looks to a new and better kingdom of a greater than David who is to come, they could not see past these temporal heroes and see the greatness of the one that was promised and prophesied and pictured in the Old Testament. How can David call his messianic son Lord? 
One author calls this statement in Psalm 110, David's creed. This is David's confession. It begins with this heavenly and triumphant ascription. Jehovah, Yahweh, said to my Adonai, my sovereign one, my master. It's a picture of, of, the, of David knowing the Messiah in the Old Testament, having a relationship already in some mysterious way with the Son of God. David's messianic son is Lord over all, including King David. He's seated in the highest throne over all. He is at the right hand of the Father. And this is introduced to us right in the beginning of the Psalms. When you walk into that wondrous collection of, of inspired songs, we are greeted in Psalm 2 with the only begotten who is exalted against all of these enemies. It almost is placed there to tell us you can't understand this book apart from this one who is to be sent and exalted over all. And all enemies, not only Roman ones, but all who oppose Jehovah and his anointed, it says in that psalm, he shall break them with a rod of iron and shall shatter them like earthenware. So how, if David calls him Lord, is he David's son? And so we see as these two sides come together, the interpretive key is the deity of the Messiah, that he is God come in the flesh, as John tells us. We read in Isaiah's prophecy, the same shoot springing out of the stem of Jesse, David's father, is the one who sits on the throne of David in Isaiah 9. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. Isaiah's contemporary, Micah, one of the minor prophets, wrote, in chapter 5, verse 2, famous Christmas verse. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And here is yet another kingly psalm of similar caliber. Psalm 45, 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Here is God speaking to one who he calls God. Little wonder that John begins his gospel with these unparalleled lines. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the deity of Christ, as prophesied in the Old Testament, we cannot make sense of the Bible. It's the interpretive key. And the Jews and other Unitarians throughout the ages have been running as fast as they can from texts like Psalm 2 and Psalm 45 and Psalm 110 as being messianic. Many of the places in the Old Testament that once Jewish teachers said, well, speaking of Christ, when they recognize how parallel they are with this Jesus of Nazareth, they've all of a sudden changed their tune. That holds especially true of Isaiah 53. That passage so clearly teaches the crucified Savior sent into the world that as it was regularly read at the time of Passover, immediately after the days of Christ's resurrection, Jews were coming to Jesus as the Messiah regularly. They stopped using it at Passover. But the followers of this Jesus, who opens his own psalm here in Luke chapter 20, take the opposite tack. It's we who sing these beautiful lines, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by man rejected, yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. By his son God now has spoken, tis the true and faithful word. So the New Testament sees this revelation of the coming Messiah as Savior to the world, fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth and no other. They see the preparatory nature of the Old Testament witness instead of living in the past and, and saying, oh, that those days were here again. They saw all of those heroes pointing to this greater than David who was to come. 
and who was to come not only to save the Jews, but also the Gentiles, which was the, at the very outset of the covenant made with Father Abraham, that the nations would be blessed through his seed. This king, greater than King David, comes conquering and still to conquer. Not the Goliath who is now sitting on the throne of Augustus, but the red dragon, the serpent of old, as we read in the book of Revelation. The triumphs of Christ are not in the shed blood of his enemies on the field of battle. That will take place at the end of days, to be sure. But as he says elsewhere, I have not come to judge to shed blood, but rather to shed my own blood for my enemies, whose blood, Christ's blood, speaks better things than Abel's. He comes not for vengeance, but he comes rather to cry out for mercy. How untiring are New Testament authors pointing to the one hanging on the cross to say this is the one anticipated in the Old Testament. This is the one who, whom Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. This is the one that Moses pointed to. A prophet like me will the Lord raise up. You must listen to him. He is the one to whom Jeremiah and all the prophets gave testimony. That's how we are to read the Old Testament. They quote these passages with confidence and with joy. And they say, this one, Jesus, this is that. Those prophecies, those exceedingly great and precious prophecies, exceedingly great and precious promises, exceedingly great and precious pictures show Jesus over and over and over again. This Psalm 110, as we've already said, is quoted the most. More than any other Old Testament passage, Psalm 110 is the most referred to passage in the New Testament. You cannot understand these tremendous words which open the psalm without the deity of David's Lord, who is also David's son. God and man in one. Emmanuel, God with us, as Isaiah put it. The other gospel accounts, when they deal with Jesus turning this question back to them, they give a little bit more insight than Luke does on the response. In the Matthew, Matthew's account, he says, no one was able to answer him a word after this, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. And Mark takes it in another direction. After saying these things, he writes, and the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. They delighted to hear him speak. Luke has nothing. Just goes on to the next thing. I believe in some way that he leaves it here just empty as if, as if to let us make our own assumptions, leaving all of us hanging. What do I think about this? And moves us to think for ourselves about these things. Do I get this? Do I understand who this Jesus is? Who does he make himself to be? Do I understand that David's son, born in David's line, this promised Messiah, is also David's Lord, David's God? You know, it's fascinating that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is not only called the son of David, he's also called the root of David. That David comes from him as well as he comes from David. David was part of a long human line which stretched back to Judah, the kingly tribe at the end of Genesis as Jacob was prophetically giving blessings to his children. It goes back to the line of Abraham. It goes to the line of Shem and the son of Noah and to the line of Seth who was appointed in the stead of Abel and ultimately to the very first gospel promise, the seed of the woman who had crushed the serpent's head at the beginning of Genesis. Dr. Morton Smith, my professor in seminary, the late Dr. Smith, used to love to say, say it repeatedly, that is the seed promise from which all other promises grow. Here is one whom God would provide, who would undo those terrible things that had just happened with the fall of mankind through Adam. This is one that would come who would undo sin who would remedy sin, who would somehow fix sin and atone for sin that has separated us from God. This seed of the woman must undo death. 
must undo the misery and the punishments for sin which we deserve and somehow bring back a paradise again as he pleases. And this one must undo the wicked one, the kingdom of darkness, the devil and his works must be destroyed. So whatever this seed of the woman is to be and to do, it has to undo all the things that had just happened in that worst of all chapters. John Lightfoot, one of the Westminster divines, put it this way, our redemption must answer the fall. Our redemption must answer the fall. The rest of the Bible is written in answer to what happens in Genesis 3. He goes on and says, Christ must fulfill the law as we had broken it. And he has. This is what we have in him. Great David's far greater son. Far, far greater, for he is the son of God come in the flesh. And there is one book in the scriptures that is dedicated to this very theme. In fact, there are those who are of the mind that the book of Hebrews itself is a lengthy exposition of Psalm 110. It's taking out those themes and highlighting them for us. That is the book of betters, a better covenant, a better priest, uh, and so forth. And what I want us to do here as we wrap up this evening is highlight three major Christological betters arising from the son of David who has now come into the world with his new covenant. Take Hebrews chapter 1 and 2. That speaks of Christ's deity, doesn't it? Here is one greater than all of the angels, and yet becoming like unto his brethren, being fully man. In that first chapter, all the angels worship him. The author lists item after item. He is called God. He sits in the throne of God. He lays the foundation of all creation. And he will even outlast the heavens themselves. You are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But then it turns right around in chapter 2, and he stoops to reach the sons of, of men. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So in 1 and 2, there's the incarnation of our Lord. Come to save us by standing in our stead. And the book of Hebrews continues. He is the greater than both Moses and Aaron, beginning in chapter 3. Here is a better prophet than Moses. Here is a better priesthood than led by Aaron. He was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also in all his house, for he had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Again, a reference to Jesus being the creator. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. So like Moses, Jesus is the servant of the Lord. Where Moses failed and could not enter the promised land, Christ brings all of his own into that rest which is above. And then Christ is a greater priest with a greater sacrifice and serving a far greater temple than Aaron's. Christ comes not in the Levitical line. There's a ma major section in there about Melchizedek. He comes according to this ancient priest. Again, a quote from Psalm 110. This priesthood will do what the Levitical priesthood could never do. That is, unite all three offices, prophet, priest, and king, into one. Christ is the priest greater than Abraham, like Melchizedek was. He serves a better ministry. The Levites all were temporal. They were limited by this thing called death. Christ brings in the perfect sacrifice once for all. The priest of the tabernacle did something, could, could never do one thing that was outstanding. That was to sit down. 
There was no chair. There was no place for them to say, all sacrifice has been completed. They always had to stand in order to serve again and again and again and again. Listen to these tremendous words in Hebrews 10. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, that is Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So there's the better priesthood. And here's the better tabernacle built by him. When Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who'd been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. All of those sacrifices, all of those priesthood, uh, that could not in and of itself do anything, except for as they were imaging what Jesus would accomplish. And that's why David could, as we sang earlier in Psalm 32, which I'm so glad that was chosen tonight, the Old Testament believers had full remission of sins not based upon the, the, the lamb that they brought, but because of the lamb of God who would in time be sent and enter into this, this priesthood and fulfill it as only Christ could. So a better uh, prophet, a better uh, priest in Christ. And then thirdly, the book of Hebrews concludes with a better covenant and a better kingdom. That is better covenant promises that cut to the heart of the matter regarding faith and salvation and the new life. You and I, we behold Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Old Testament believers were incomplete without these New Testament times, without us, it says at the end of Hebrews chapter 11. Has it never struck you as you're reading through, through the Old Testament, would you like to live in the days of Jeremiah? And try to understand how, in, how is this God's word through the prophet that we're supposed to just capitulate to Babylon? What a totally politically incorrect message that was to people who wanted to hold on to the land, hold on to the old ways. It's very difficult to be a believer in the Old Testament. But the New Testament, oh, all of these things that were inward and as it were more mysterious are brought out through Jesus. They serve the copies of the heavenly pattern in the mountain. We serve the heavenly pattern itself, come down to us in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then this, a better kingdom life, with a better sonship now. We are sons and daughters of the living God. We are one family as believers, which, are, which is international. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was limited to one family. In the New, we see how it spreads throughout every tongue and tribe and people. We serve before the better mountain without the darkness and loudness and fearfulness and the death that shrouds Mount Sinai. We come to a heavenly Jerusalem that is above. And you and I have a better kingdom which cannot be shaken. And out of this heavenly Zion, founded by Christ the Lord, ascended on high to the right hand of the Father who leads captivity captive, flow all these streams in every direction, watering the earth, blessing the church. And that's, I think, why Hebrews ends the way that it does, with just a, a flourish of all of the blessings of knowing this better, uh, this better way. Loving the brethren, hospitality to strangers, remembering prisoners, keeping marriage pure, not coveting, bearing the reproach of Christ as we go outside the camp with his cross, offering the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, sharing in fellowship, joyful leadership, all being equipped by God to do what pleases him. And all of this flows from the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, 
through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord and David's Lord, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the wonders of the incarnation, the glories, Lord, of both your humiliation and your exaltation, for your glorious offices of prophet, priest, and king, that you are, the, you are David's Lord as well as David's son. You are the king of kings. You are over all, and we bless you forever. Help us, as the book of Hebrews says, to keep our confidence, our, our boast of hope in you, that you and you alone are our life, and nothing can take that away. Nothing can replace that in this life, in this world. Lord, help us to go from this place tonight refreshed, knowing your presence with us, that as you are exalted over all, your eyes are upon all. You rule in the affairs above and among the kingdoms of men, and there's nothing too hard for you to do. Answer our prayers that we offered earlier, that you would indeed be the refuge of your people, that you'd bring repentance where we have strayed, and grant, Lord, um, your blessings to your, your children to walk in your ways, to walk closely with the living God. Lord, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful salvation, Trinitarian salvation, as the Father sends forth the Son. The Son willingly delights to come to be our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit rejoices uh, to dwell in the midst of the people of God and to bring them all home at last. So, Lord, help us to live before your face, even as David did. Make this our creed as well, that Jesus is our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Psalm 110a, as we close tonight, the Lord said to my Lord in the Psalter hymnal, let's stand and give thanks to our King. God's rich blessing upon you as you serve him in this needy generation. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Amen.